Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, bringing you another guides, tips, and tricks video. This time we are talking about Pericles' Greek Empire here. So let's dive right in and take a look at these bonuses. First off, uh, we have Surrounded by Glory. 5% culture per city-state you're the suzerain of. I do not think very much of this ability. So un and unlike every other sieve, which is contrasted to other sieves first, and then, uh, well, contrasted almost entirely to other sieves is what I'm look, trying to say. Like if you're looking at how strong is Arabia, you're talking about how does Arabia compare to other sieves. The first kind of contrast you have to do with Greece is to the other Greek sieve. Since you're playing essentially a, a sieve that has the same, the, the vast majority of your bonuses are identical, the Acropolis, the Hoplite, and then uh, the Republic here. The, the, the immediate comparison point, the first thing your mind is drawn to is, well, which of the Greeks are, which of the Greek sieves are better and, and why? And like, what are the differences between these Greek sieves? And then kind of after that, you compare it to the other sieves. So I want to do that first. So this is the one that I want to talk about uh, first and foremost, which is how does this 5% culture per city state you're the suzerain of actually compare to getting culture off kills, including kills off of barbarians? And unfortunately, it compares really poorly because really what this is, this is a better mid to late game bonus because in the mid to late game, unless you are warring aggressively with another player, uh, most of the time you've contained your barbarians. There's long periods of times where you don't have any kills on a turn. So you're getting almost no bonus from the plus culture per kill. However, plus 5% culture per city state you're suzerain of, you may be suzerain realistically between three and four uh, uh, city states if you really have prioritized doing that. Uh, maybe a little bit more, but most times not. Most times if you're playing against other players, uh, there's quite a lot of aggressive um, envoy placement to try to keep, take, care, take care of the city states, to take over the city states. So you're probably not getting more than about 20% culture from this on a good game, uh, which is a chunk. That's a lot of culture, uh, especially in the mid to late game. But in the early game, that's not a lot of culture. And in the early game, the you're A, going to have less envoys. You're probably only getting something like 5% culture. B, your base, the raw amount of culture your cities are yielding is not that much. So that uh, a percent base modifier doesn't give you all that much absolute culture per turn. Whereas barb kills in the very, very early game are giving you a fair amount of culture. If you think about what the base culture is when you start a game, right? If I were just to settle this city, and what do we have out of this? We're sitting at 1.4 culture. If I get a barb kill for like 5 culture or like barb kill like a couple barb kills in a turn like when i'm fighting the initial like uh set of camps that are going to be spawning from that percentage wise that's like a three i mean imagine it was five that's about a 300 percent increase right i mean if we're getting like five culture out of that so or a 300 percent of my culture going into that now if you're getting other things like that if you're getting two or three barb kills per turn the amount of culture you get in the early game is huge so why do we care about the early game compared to the late game? Well, the early game has some really, really important things in here uh, that you're rushing for. One of the best and most important early game policies is this one, 50% production towards settlers, which is a really, really big increase in your actual production you're doing when you're trying to expand, which is part of the early game. The other really big deal in the, in the early game is political philosophy where you get your first government choice, where you go from a two-slot government to a four-slot government, which is also a really, really big increase. So these policies are really critical to get, and the timing really matters on them. So getting a, a bonus, you're not even going to, you're not going to have any suzerain status before, before political philosophy, pretty much ever. Maybe if you get very, very lucky and you text straight for horseback riding and the first envoy, you, you, you meet a city state first, you immediately complete their, their quest, which gives you two, and then you immediately go into the classical era through horseback riding and it gives you another quest that you're immediately able to do. You might get those three envoys to get the minimum required for a suzerain status before you hit political philosophy but not very often, not consistently, and most times it just isn't going to occur. So most times, these early timing things, the only things that are going to impact these are your Pantheon, that's why one of the reasons why Culture Pantheon is so powerful, your, your, um, the bonuses of, uh, that your Civ has, so for example, Rome having a free monument is incredibly powerful because it's a building that then you don't have to build that gives you more than double your culture to start with right at the start of the game, so that's pretty damn awesome. And then, uh, um, what would you say? And then uh, any other uh, 
any other types of civilization bonuses you're going to do. So basically, you know, the infrastructure you build, monument versus not monument, the bonuses your civ has, uh, whether it has a culture bonus or not, and the pantheon you have, whether or not that has a culture bonus or not. That's pretty much it. Those are pretty much the only bonuses you're going to have in the early game to rushing towards each of these critical timing windows. Things like builder production, settler production, and uh, extra government slots. Now, that doesn't very favorable, unfortunately, for poor old Pericles here, because Pericles doesn't have any real bonus to the early game culture. So this is a mid to late game culture bonus, which is just worse. It's it's it is nice to have a mid to late game culture bonus, but really, if I had to choose between early game and mid game, if you guys have been watching these at all, you realize that the mid game stuff is less important than the early game stuff because the early game stuff is going to set the tone of your entire game. If you have government 10 turns ahead of somebody else, you're in a like a government with four slots as opposed to two, you're in really good shape compared to them in terms of general production, religious production, in terms of economic uh, growth in all of your cities, in terms of the actual things you've been able to produce in that time period. It's really impactful. And yes, there are late game policies that are, are impactful too, but the way that Civ works, it's always worked this way in all the Civ games, is it snowballs. If you have a, if you get a, if you get a you know a city out faster than your opponent and that city is growing super strong super fast and able to do things and later on your opponent's cities grow faster but it doesn't matter because you've had the entire eras in between now and later on to take advantage of that early game boost that you have that your opponent doesn't so i don't like surrounded by glory compared to uh Gorgo's um, culture from kills bonus. I think it's decent in the late game, and I think it's a good bonus as a whole, but if I have to directly compare it to the other Greek, which which of the two Greek empires would I like to play? I'd rather play Gorgo pretty much every single time, because the other bonuses are identical, and the uh, early game bonus is just better for Gorgo than it is for Pericles. All right. Let's break down the rest of the bonuses. I know we've talked about this in another video, but let's do it again. Every time we make these videos, every tier, this is the third now group of videos that I've recorded. I recorded seven, then I recorded eight, and now I'm recording the last remaining five. Um, every time I do this, I have more experience in between when I when I started talking about them and when and now when I'm recording them, right? So each batch is more, more uh, game experience for me, more learning done, more feedback from you guys, more comments read, more information absorbed so that the explanations should get better across time. So let's redo these. Let's talk about these again uh, and see how I feel about them now, uh, you know, a week or two weeks later than when I first made the original ones talking about Gorgo. So, um, how good is one wildcard policy slot? One wildcard policy slot is absolutely fucking amazing. This is still one of the absolute best bonuses in the game uh, ever uh, because it's just so powerful. It's so flexible. It's so powerful out throughout the course of the game. It's really, really good, uh, not only in the sense of just having an extra card all the time, which is particularly good for, of course, like, you know, economic card slots are really good. Um, when you, there's very specific military ones that you want to switch up a lot that are very, very good as well, like the upgrade cost one, uh, things like this. The builder and seller policy ones are really good, so getting those out early. Uh, you can still do things with this bonus that you can't do as other civilizations. You could, for example, rust, rush mysticism. I don't often recommend this, but you could go straight down to mysticism, and because you have uh, wild card slots and nobody else does in the early game, you can plug in either great scientist points or uh, great profit points in the early game that before, uh, political philosophy where everybody else is the only time that other people are able to use this because you can't put wildcard policies into anything except wildcard slots although you can put every other type of policy into a wildcard slot as well so that that means that greek not only had the greek uh, civs not only have the flexibility to put additional uh, economic or military policy slots in if they choose to rush either mysticism or military tradition they can put uh, card slots in that no other civ has access to this time of the game so you could rush a great general as greece and then rush somebody if you wanted and all of your units are going to have the combat strength given to them by the great general and your opponent's not going to have any counterplay at that period of time because it's so much faster than for you than it is for him to get those military points same with the profit you can probably get um Stonehenge does put a little bit of a stop to that because people can, uh, Stonehenge is not there, but because people can rush a religion with Stonehenge, you might not be guaranteed first religion uh, going uh, early great profit points as Greece, but if you wanted to, you could probably guarantee second religion at the very least. Um, granted, religions aren't all that strong, so that's not super useful. That's okay. Same with scientists. You could rush them. I don't see much of a reason to do an early scientist rush, but you'll see what scientists you have options to. You can see that in the great person screen whenever you want to have a sense of what you're actually rushing for. So... Anyways, I think that ability remains extremely powerful, uh, the wild, the free wildcard slot. And if anything, uh, as strategies get a little bit more uh, developed, I think the early general in particular becomes really, really cool with that. Let's talk about the hoplite. Um, the hoplite remains 
I, I thought I think I rated them a little higher than I would now in retrospect. I've kind of come back down a little bit on them, um, especially in the early uh, stages of the multiplayer play. You were getting horsemen rush nonstop. Everyone was horse rush, horsemen rushing everybody else. So it was particularly nice to have a unit that was strong versus horsemen. Um, and it's not super strong versus horsemen, but it is basically the strongest counter you're going to have versus horsemen prior to horsemen, which is nice, uh, which means that they are 25 combat unit strength, uh, combat strength unit rather, which is the same as a Spearman. However, they get additional 10 combat strength when standing next to another Hoplite. Uh, and they also, as a, as a uh, anti-cab unit, have a specific bonus versus uh, uh, light and heavy cavalry units of their own, which means they're going to be. Uh, I think it's. I think it's a ten bonus. So I think it's forty-five uh, versus horsemen, which is actually meaningful. And especially now, if you stack that forty-five with also fortification bonus of six, and then another uh, rough terrain bonus of three or four, they're going to start to be very, very strong versus horsemen. Which means you can actually defend horsemen rushes with that. The problem is they're not very strong versus anything else. Um, yeah, in pairs they're okay. But they're not, they're not a great unit is what it boils down to. They're pretty damn good for defending against horsemen, but not so useful for much of anything else. And the biggest problem I have with this line of units is it's just not a very good line of units. Uh, pikemen, which ought to be a counter to knights, are way, way deeper in the tree than knights are. And... Pikemen give you no ability to hit back. If your opponent attacks you and you you have some fortified pikemen, okay, he just kind of goes around those fortified pikemen with his knights that are much, much faster than your units and pillages everything of yours, and you're still in really bad shape. I, I have not been able to counter knights by going pikemen yet. It's a, it's a later tech. The units aren't stronger. The units are 41 strength compared to 48, which means when you get your anti-cab bonus, it's still not that much better. They're slower. Uh... They upgrade from spearmen, and spearmen are just not that great in the early game. Uh, I don't, I don't like that line of units very much. However, hoplites are still quite good at doing their job of defending versus horsemen in the early game, uh, or versus heavy cav. So they're okay. I don't think they're quite as good as I initially gave them credit for, but I still think they're pretty damn good. And it is nice to have an early game unique unit because early game unique units tend to be better than the mid and late game unique units, just because they have a bigger impact sooner. All right, that brings us to the final bonus of Pericles' Greek Empire. Let's talk about the Acropolis. Um, as uh, is true for all uh, unique uh, districts, it does not count towards your district cap, which is quite nice. Um, the Let's go actually have a look at it. Uh, it is plus one culture for each adjacent wonder, plus one culture for each adjacent district, which is better than the theater square. Theater square is half a... Uh, it's plus one culture for every two adjacent districts. And then uh, you get plus one culture for being adjacent to the city center. Um, city center, I believe, is also a district. So I think this would be, uh, I think this was solved in the YouTube comments. I still have not actually directly tested this, uh, but my understanding is this means that if you settle it next to your city, if you put a theater, uh, the, the Acropolis next to your city, it's going to be plus one culture for being adjacent to a district tile and plus one culture again for being adjacent to the city center. Uh, and if you put another district next to it, it's also then going to get another plus one culture. So it's going to be between two and three culture if you build this in the early game, uh, which really isn't that bad. Um, it starts to be... The thing about the districts is this, right? So districts are available at a tech or a, a civics tree timing as opposed to actually at a, uh, as opposed to just being available immediately. So I've, I asked some people asked in the comment sections of the other Greek video, well, couldn't you build an Acropolis instead of a monument and basically have it be a better monument that gives you other things as well? It does give you the great, the great writer, the great artist, and the great musician points, uh, which by the way, aren't all that useful in the early game, but are okay, especially if you're going to do some sort of tourism style victory. And I have now won a tourism victory in multiplayer. So it's possible. I don't know how, uh, Likely it's going to be to do that multiple times as people catch on, but at least snuck in one tourism victory. Um, and the base cost is uh, not ridiculous. But the thing about the district costs are they go up over time. Um, this is good and bad for uh, civs with unique districts. What it means is you can't just say, well, how does a uh, Acropolis compare to a monument in terms of cost? Because the cost that you're going to have uh, for your Acropolis is going to be based on the civics text you have and the uh, science text you have. And in particular, because this is only available at drama and poetry, this is the prerequisite civics tech needed to build this, it means that you're ne it's never going to be as cheap as it could be, right? It's never going to start at, uh, at the... At, it's not like you can place this the same turn as the monument. So you're not really making that comparison. It's going to be heavier in terms of hammers than the monument is going to be pretty much always, uh, if I understand that correctly. However, you can place this because it's a unique district and it doesn't count towards your um, district cost, your total number of districts a city has. You can place this the, um, the 
first time that's available to do so. The instant you hit drama and poetry, you should place your Acropolis, even if you're not planning on finishing building it. You should just get it down in the position you want it, then switch back to whatever production you want. That way it will keep the uh, the district as cheap as it can possibly be uh, to come back to and finish building it. Uh, and that's true of all districts. Uh, if you have the population in your city to build a district and you have the tech, uh, be it a civics tech or a tech tech, uh, science tech, then you should place that district while you can to keep that cost down for when you actually want to go back and finish it. But what it does mean for the Greek empire as a whole is that you could, you, you should definitely place all of these in all of your Greek cities uh, as soon as you get the tech available for that, which means that these are going to be cheaper by the time you actually want to build them. Whereas other civs are going to be having other civs, especially other civs that don't have unique districts are going to have to be worried about their district pop. So they're not going to be able to place their uh, cultural district as soon as they can. They're going to have to place the commerce district first, probably, probably the, the industrial or the harbor district second, uh, and then probably a campus before. And that's going to require, you know, think about the pop points on that. It's pop one for one district, pop four for the second district and pop uh, seven for the third district and pop 10 for the fourth district. If you're looking at harbor commerce, hub, um, campus and industrial hub, you're not going to be able to place these cultural districts to much, much, much later in other other uh, civilizations compared to Greece. So there is that advantage of it being the unique district that you can place those um, much, much earlier than you would be otherwise without harming the development of your city to make them much cheaper than the other civilizations are going to have when they're actually building the cost. Not only because they're half off because it's unique, but also because you're placing them earlier and that cost hasn't had a chance to go up as much as it will by the time the other players have a chance to build them based on the district cap. Okay. Uh, but there's still some major problems with the Acropolis, and one of those major problems we addressed in the other video, but I want to point out again, and that is for some unknowable reason, uh, this requires a, uh, it says it in here somewhere, it requires to be on a hill, yeah. So, the problem is you don't always have a hill that's adjacent to your city center, and the, the cultural yield is nice, but it's not so early as to be great. We've already talked about really the culture before political philosophy is absolutely amazing. It's much more valuable than immediately after political philosophy. And yes, in the late game, there's lots of really valuable political uh, cultural things. The second tier of government comes to mind. Uh, the enlightenment to get uh, rationalism comes to mind. Uh, things like urbanization come to mind, both nationalism and then later on mobilization are super important. There's a lot of really strong civics texts to do. So it's not like culture isn't valuable in the later game. It's just right in the early game. If you can get any boost to culture to rush out your government or rush out your settler cards or rush out your builder cards, that's monumental in terms of its impact. Uh, no, no pun intended about the value of that monument early. Um, so I really dislike the fact that the Acropolis requires that hill because it just makes it very situationally difficult to do. And the timing on the, the civics tech makes that really painful as well. Perhaps if it was available earlier, I might consider rushing it instead of a monument if it was available at the start of the game or something like that. Maybe that would be a little bit more powerful. But as a whole, I'm just not overly thrilled with this district. It is slightly better than I initially gave it credit to, both because my understanding of districts has changed over time. Uh, my understanding of how they, the cost of them as well as the population uh, limitations for unique districts that was not known to me when I first recorded the first set of uh, very first set, first set of videos, although it was known for the second one. So it's a little bit better than I initially gave it credit for, but I still don't think it's all that good, uh, seeing as I don't think the cultural district is, is as good as many of the other existing districts. All right, guys, hopefully that was useful and informative. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button here on YouTube or come check me out on Twitch and hit the follow button there. Um, I do do a lot of Civ 6 content and will continue to do so. Um, so uh, yeah, so hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching.